Well, thank you, Marlon, for your warm welcome. And I'm delighted to be here. And hello to everyone joining us online for this important discussion. From the islands of Palawan in the Philippines to the Gola Forest of Sierra Leone, communities have bravely used the law to take on the companies and investors who pollute their environment and destroy their forests. The efforts of communities advocating for their own land and environmental justice keep us all safer. Despite the importance of this critical work, however, land and environmental justice defenders face huge obstacles to justice, especially from those who want to maintain the status quo. In this session, we will explore how governments, businesses and advocates can support grassroots environmental justice efforts that are critical to the fight against climate change. We'll focus on four topics. Enshrining the rights of community, for community decision-making in law. Trusting community monitoring and ground truthing. Protecting the defenders. And investing in environmentally harmed or vulnerable communities. We touch on how each of these elements is key for communities to be able to use the rule of law to protect the environment. We'll hear about experiences from the government of Sierra Leone, the Environmental Legal Aid Assistance Center, ELAC, in the Philippines, ProDesk in Mexico, and the Legal Empowerment Fund. I'm delighted to be joined today by Jobo Samba of the government of Sierra Leone, Jerti Mayo Enda, Environmental Legal Assistance Center, ELAC, uh, Gabriel Gustavo Roca Belloni of ProDesk, and Atieno Odiamo Ambo of the Legal Empowerment Fund. You can read their full biographies on the uh, conference platform. Later in the day, we'll break into subgroups to discuss what has worked on the four key areas that I've mentioned. So let's begin. An important component that enables communities to protect their land is a legal right to have a say in the development that happens on their land. In Sierra Leone, the parliament is currently deliberating on proposed legislation that affords communities the right to, 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 over, to consent over any development on the land that they own or use. So Jobo Samba, the head of the National Land Policy and Voluntary Guidelines Implementation Secretariat at Sierra Leone's Ministry of Lands, Housing and Country Planning, has led the development of the National Land Commission and customary land rights bills. So Jobo, can you give us a brief description, a brief background about the Land Rights Bill and explain the key components of the bill, especially on the role of communities in decision making? Over to you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for giving me the floor to um, provide a brief background on the work we have been doing on the current legislations that is in parliament right now for ratification. But <clears throat> before I go ahead, I want to express our sincere thanks to the organizers of this program. I also want to say thanks to our partners, our development partners like um, the FAO, the World Bank, for supporting the government of Sierra Leone in, in this effort. I also want to quickly thank, say thanks to our, the CSOs who have been also supporting um, the government in these initiatives like Namati, Green Scenery, We Had Land for Life. We want to say thanks to them. Um, <coughs> for supporting the government of Syria, excuse me. So um, the two bills we you have talked about, uh, which is the National Land Commission and Customary Land Right Bill, I mean, stem from the um, piloting the implementation of the um, National Land Policy, which was approved in November 2015. Mm -hmm. um, we started... Um, the national land policy actually provides for 
I mean, legal reforms that includes review of existing laws and also designing of new laws, I mean, to meet the current trend of land administration and governance and basically to provide and look for ways to include communities in decision making and then in the management of natural resources in this country. So in order to bring these recommendations <coughs> into effect, the government of Sierra Leone in 2019 commenced the process to develop the customary land rights bill and the um, National Land Commission bill. Um, these bills are actually designed to bring into legal effect the, um, the recommendations enshrined into the um, into the national land 2015 national land policy. So um, the process of developing the bills have been really very inclusive and participatory. That includes uh, using a multi-stakeholder approach where development partners, CSOs, <coughs> excuse me, government institutions were all involved in the development process. So, um, for the customary land rights bill, it is basically designed to protect um, customary land rights, eliminate discrimination um, in the management and administration of customary land rights, position the land under customary tenure for responsible investment, and generally provide guide on how we will manage land under customary tenure management and administration of land under customary tenure. Um, the, 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 the National Land Commission also is to establish bodies that will be responsible for um, the management and administration of land in the country. It's also designed to decentralize land administration, well, to decentralize and make land administration and management in the country participatory and inclusive. Um, so the National Land Commission, specifically involving I mean communities and, and other stakeholders in the um, in the management and administration of land in this country, now provides for um, the setting up of the district land commission, the chiefdom land committee, and a village area land committee. So at chiefdom level, at a district level. <coughs> The district land commission will be responsible and playing a role at national at district level for land um, administration. Why at chiefdom level, a chiefdom land committee will be established, and the chiefdom land committee will include um, um, communities, which um, will include the paramount chief who will serve as head of the chiefdom land committee, and then you will have land owning families coming from different parts of the chiefdom to be part of the chiefdom land committee and then also land owning families people who own land and also oh, it provides for people who do not own land but you use land to also participate in the chiefdom land committee so the chiefdom land committee will now be responsible for the management headed by the paramount chief will be responsible for the management and administration of land at the chiefdom level. And then, I mean, the same applies to the village area land committee, where in the village, um, the, the town chief or the head of the town will be, um, will be, will be um, the, will be, will be the head of the village area land committee. And the village area land committee will comprise of um, will comprise of land users and land owners in the community. And um, interestingly, and more importantly, this bill provides that thirty percent of the composition of um, the village area land committee and this committee should be women. So essentially, this is the effort. This is the work the government of Sierra Leone has done to. Um, make sure that communities are involved in decision making as it relates to land management and administration in the country. I thank you very much. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple of questions. Do you expect the bill to be passed soon? And what challenges, challenges do you see for the bill's approval through the parliament? Um, 
we the government is highly motivated to pass the bill and it will pass soon we envision the ministry envision that we this process is something we will complete this june the bill to be passed this june and then the because the government is highly motivated to position land for responsible investment but also we vision this bill to be providing the conducive environment and the foundation for revenue generation and 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 support to government efforts so essentially we believe that we are motivated to pass the bill in this month june before it ends the bills should be passed and then um one of the challenge we do envisage in the process <coughs> excuse me we have completed all of the inclusive consultative process that's included all stakeholders we are now moving to the parliamentary processes um this is where we do envision we do envisage that you know because land is really very sensitive and the interest in land is really very high so we still believe that um at the parliamentary level i mean there will still be people who will want to also i mean bring in their own personal 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 opinion into what the ministry have proposed but however i mean the good news is that the ministry will be there and the ministry understands and have um a position for all of the provisions in the bills so we'll be there to ensure that i mean the bill is 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 is, is intact and it is left in a way that it will uh, achieve the goals and aims of what we are thinking in terms of tenure governance in this country thank you very much over to you good jobo um thank you for giving us an example of how a national government can give power to communities that are on the front lines of this land and environmental justice work. Let's turn now to our colleagues from ELAC and Prodesk, two civil society organizations that work closely with grass, grassroots communities that are most impacted by the effects of climate change. And I'll first ask Jerti Mayo Anda about community monitoring of environmental impacts. We know that governments are widely under-resourced in monitoring corporate compliance with environmental regulations in many cases official monitoring of corporate impacts is inefficient and reports come out far too late communities have done their own monitoring of environmental impacts and brought evidence to corporate and administrative authorities so jerthy can you tell us about the work of elac and its partner communities in the area of monitoring environmental impacts what's the importance of communities involvement in monitoring and evidence gathering over to you. Uh, good evening, Ma Mary, uh, Marlon, and all our colleagues from the Mati, and all our friends from all over the world. Um, for more than 20 years in interacting with local communities as part of our legal empowerment work, we have seen how they have been frustrated by, example, the encroachment into the ancestral domains of extractive um, and, and destructive projects which have not undergone appropriate environmental impact assessments or free empire informed consent processes and con consultations and communities therefore want to be actively involved in identifying the gaps in the enforcement of the laws they want to secure photographs of the violations the destruction to their forests the ancestral domains their marine protected areas and in the process elac therefore in working with them has designed capacity building activities on documentation, evidence gathering, and we design these trainings. We confer with them and we do workshops. And in the process of actually doing these workshops, trainings, and doing role plays to document and gather evidence, we have seen how important it has been that evidence from the communities play a critical role in being able to convince an administrative agency that indeed uh, this corporate entity has breached environmental laws or that this uh, entity or corporation has encroached into the forest area or a marine protected areas of ancestral territories. So documentation is part of our case buildup, whether it is administrative cases uh, or civil or criminal cases, they are important. Photographs, petitions, certified two copies of 
government documents are being secured. The, in the process, communities also need to understand that when you do monitoring and you gather evidence, it has to relate to a specific law, which, is, which are being violated, or law or laws which are being violated, because um, it's not easy to understand, example, the environmental impact assessment process, the role in consultation, in multipartite monitoring teams. It's also not easy to um, take stock of, you know, forestry violations, fishery violations, or even land loss. So um, the process of capacity building is really very important, and it takes time to be able to do this. Now, the importance of why they have to be involved, because they are key witnesses, they're on the ground, and we also want to make sure that the effort of monitoring the state of the natural resources and the environment become sustained. They can work with village officials, with municipal officials, with civil society, with conservation groups. But I need to emphasize, we have seen that when communities, indigenous peoples, farmers, fisher folk, uh, women, young people really get involved and they scrutinize the activities the laws violated, then it becomes, it's clearer. It becomes convincing to the agencies involved. And when they go to court, they actually reveal a lot of the narratives, the, the stories that um, have not been heard. Um, finally, I'd also like to emphasize that the um, gathering of all this important information, they need to be sustained because monitoring efforts are also cost centers and, and therefore um, government also has to invest um, mm. and make sure that local people get involved in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Jersey, for those important points. I'm now going to ask Gabriel Gustavo Rocha Baloni to talk about the work of ProDesk. In many countries, especially in Latin America, land and environmental defenders face constant threats to continue their work. Many defenders have been killed, as I know well, and one of the key programs of ProDesk is its community security program, helping communities safeguard their collective safety and security. So, Gabriel, what is ProDesk doing under this program? Over to you. Gracias. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to be in this uh, space, especially the interpretation services, making this dialogue possible. I'm going to start talking a little bit about the job that we do at ProDesk or the project for economical social uh, rights. We are a human rights organization for women founded more than 15 years ago. Our uh, Alejandra Anchega is our current uh, president. We work with indigenous uh, countries and with collectives of workers in uh, precarization uh, jobs. Uh, our job is focused in promoting and also demanding economical, social, and cultural rights of these communities and vulnerable collectives. In this process and this experience for over 15 years, we have identified, like it was mentioned before, that exercising human rights, especially in Latin America, brings uh, risks for the defenders of these rights. For during our history, ProDesk has looked for uh, assisting or looking for demanding the implementation of mechanisms from the state to defend and protect these defense defenders that include aspects like uh, measurements and protection from the state. Nonetheless, uh, short after we realized that the options or the measures given by the state to keep the safety of people were not enough. And that we had to start working, strengthening and reflecting with the communities and with the collectives 
to try to identify how these people feel safe in their territories, but also to strengthen the practices, the traditional practices and the from the ancestors that these communities and collectives have. We realize that in context where collectives and communities uh, face risks that are not only from the state, but also from transnational uh, companies, the measurements are not enough to guarantee their safety. In this sense, in protest, we have uh, some initiatives to promote our proposal that we call community safety. First of all, we have uh, books uh, regarding security. You can see them through our page, and I can share it on the chat for this presentation too. At the same time, from ProDesk, we work directly with the communities and collectives that we give advice to, uh, legal advice to identify what are the mechanisms for the safety that the communities have and how we can strengthen those in a systematic way. At the same time, we have trainings through the, uh, and with those through a virtual platform and uh, in person sessions, we strengthen the abilities of organizations and communities that defend the land and the territory to strengthen their mechanisms, uh, their own mechanisms for safety. This implies uh, giving them advice for protocols and safety plans. And finally, from protest, we also uh, have something that we have the Latin American network uh, that it has 30 organizations from seven different countries from Latin America that we meet once a year in, the, in Mexico City to develop a context analysis regarding the current state of the right to defend human rights in Latin America, and also to share experiences and good practices in uh, the topic of community safety and protection. And their focus is the needs and the abilities of the communities and the collectives that we work with. Thank you very much. Thank you both Gabrielle and Jersey for highlighting the importance of close partnerships between civil society organizations, especially legal empowerment groups and grassroots communities. Indeed, these partnerships are essential to support the work of communities in defending their land and environment, and of course, in safeguarding themselves. And that brings us to our next topic, Capacity building initiatives for communities require financial resources. Communities need financial resources and technical expertise to continue their work of protecting their land and natural resources. Innovative, po innovative pooled funds like the Legal Empowerment Fund could make a big difference to getting resources to these frontline advocates. So I'm going to call now on Atieno um, Odiambo to tell us about the Legal Empowerment Fund. Atieno, what is the Legal Empowerment Fund and how does it support the work of land and environmental justice defenders? Over to you. Thank you very much, Mary. And I, I'm, I apologize for uh, showing up late. I had a bit of uh, technical issues, um, something I always encounter in Kenya. I was surprised to find that I have the same technical issues here at The Hague. Um, thanks for that question. So the Legal Empowerment Fund, um, is a fund that was launched in September last year. And it's a 10 year multi-million dollar program of the Fund for Global Human Rights. And we, our aim is to, write, to provide resources to frontline activists and grassroots groups in order to close the global justice gap. The fund was created with the support of a constellation of funders and allies, including the Mott Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, NAMATI, uh, the International Development uh, uh, Research Center, IDRC, and pathfinders for peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. And really the goal of the fund of, uh, was to strengthen grassroots justice groups and also to help communities access the law and secure justice. I'll 
you know, this is become, be easily become a monologue. So I'll just tr uh, try and make sure that I'm not uh, a boy, you know, all of you stiff with, with, you know, vision, mission, but I wanted to at least talk about what our vision is, which is to narrow the, is to narrow the global justice gap by helping marginalized communities through the provision of resources to achieve legal agency to protect and secure their rights. And I, th I think as you all know that legal empowerment is the belief that grass is, uh, grassroots legal actors in marginalized communities are best suited to drive lasting social change. However, as we know, these groups are severely underfunded and accessing resources can become very cumbersome. And so the answer to this was the creation of the Legal Empowerment Fund, which is also to, uh, seeking to relocate the power of grant making closer to the people that it most affects. Um, we seek to provide local groups, local grassroots groups with renewable core funding, uh, which should be able to uh, enable them to uh, address inadequate legal protections. Uh, we'll also fund um, frontline legal empowerment work regardless of whether the group self-identify as legal empowerment uh, organizations. So for example, you could have women um, uh, working on uh, a group working on women's rights or a group working on indigenous people's rights. And really they don't identify as doing legal empowerment work, but the work they are doing uh, is considered legal empowerment. And so we're looking for uh, and looking to find groups that both self-identify as legal empowerment and for those who also don't uh, identify as legal empowerment entities. And one of our main goals is to make sure that we strengthen and institutionalize grassroots organizations so that 10 years later, they're much stronger and they're not just reacting to all the incoming requests for legal assistance that they get, but we're also trying to enable them to build a stronger legal infrastructure to bring about systemic change because from the ODI report and uh, a report done by ODI uh, several years ago and shows that there's a growing body of evidence that demonstrates that legal empowerment offers the potential to deliver scaled up systemic change, including through community mobilization, strategic litigation, and as long as uh, these, these, um, these, these, these change mechanisms are driven uh, by the community. You know, I'd say that um, legal empowerment also uh, democratizes and disrupts the way in which the law is practiced. And this makes it much closer to the people and gives them more agency. And when they do have agency, that is when they are able to hold public institutions and public officials uh, um, accountable. Um, I would say that, you know, for the longest time, you know, we've seen a lot of funding. And I was actually just on the, at the plenary session, lots of funding goes to organizations doing top-down legal, uh, legal work. So strengthening institutions, strengthening government bodies, but it's really not enough. And I can't say this, I, I think I, I, at some point at this forum, I think I've said it so many times, not enough funding is going to grassroots organizations. And really we have to make sure that um, in order to achieve uh, the SDG 16 plus by 2030, Yes, you must fund and you must strengthen institutions, but also institutions and organizations and communities working from uh, at the grassroots levels also need to be funded. Um, as I had mentioned before, the Legal Empowerment Fund is a, a program of the Fund for Global Human Rights, which is an organization that was funded, founded in 2002 and has been funding frontline human rights organizations um, with uh, who are who are doing grassroots work in very difficult uh, you know situations and the fund for global human rights has a very um, wonderful way of getting money in a nimble fashion very fast to grassroots organizations in very difficult uh, to reach places. Um, in addition to providing resources, we LEF also intends to create structures and methods for learning. So we are also integrating learning into our operations so that we can best understand how to support effective legal uh, empowerment work and see what, you know, what makes these efforts su successful. And we hope that by the time we have gathered all this knowledge, we'll be able to share it with civil society and with donors and governments in order to help them uh, inform efforts to tackle the pervasive injustice more effectively. I think one of the most important aspects of the LEF, the Legal Empowerment Fund, is the fact that we engage uh, in participatory grant making. And this is where by the decision power about the funding, including the strategies we're using, the criteria behind those decisions is shared with the very communities that we, we are hoping that, that we aim to serve. 
And you know, we believe that the participatory grant making process provides the opportunity to transform the vertical relationship between donors and recipients, and also to promote leadership among practitioners in the field. So we have, uh, we have, we plan to engage in uh, three types of grant making uh, to support uh, uh, legal empowerment and uh, grassroots groups. First is the open call with no thematic or geographic focus, which is to provide an, ac an accessible resource. And this is a very uh, useful way for us to reach thousands of legal empowerment groups across a wide range of um, geographies focused on different justice issues. Secondly, we're going to have focused grant making. And this is where we will focus on a particular uh, geographic area or thematic area of focus. And you know, this is uh, especially the issue of land, environmental and climate justice has really risen to the top for us. And I think that is definitely an area that we will be funding um, more um, in the future. We had a call for proposals in January and, um, a, and a large number I would say disproportionately um, issues on gender justice as well as land and environmental justice uh, rose to the top. So there are lots of groups um, globally who are working on these issues and that is we plan to have provide targeted funding in those areas. We'll also be providing learning grants so that we can share uh, and we can strengthen the sharing practice. And so in, in addition to our, our learning agenda, which will be uh, working in uh, coordination and complementing what the work that uh, NAMATI and the IDRC doing. It's important for us to also provide groups with the resources to put learning into practice, to experiment, to innovate, and then to document and share the experiences with us. When it comes to supporting a land and environmental justice, several things come to mind for me. I feel like if you want to make a difference in communities, that are most affected and impacted by the effects of climate change, we have to let them, we have to listen to these communities and we have to let them lead and we have to allow them to be the architects of the solutions. And this is a core premise and tenet of the Legal Empowerment Fund. What we seek to do is support visionary activists who are developing community-based solutions to environmental uh, issues and to build foundations of just, uh, and to help them build the foundations for sustainable future. I feel like land and environmental justice defenders use a wide array of methods which are not quote unquote mainstream. And so for example, in the in climate justice, if you look at climate justice within the realm of customary and informal justice systems, it really is a fact that these are systems and actors within these systems, especially indigenous people and local communities are very important to the governance and management of land and other natural resources in much of the world. However, the mainstream approaches that have, been, um, uh, that have been relied on to secure and protect their lands have been mostly national and international laws and not taking into account the customary laws that they have been using for decades, centuries to protect and sustain their lands. So from a legal empowerment perspective, the customary knowledge vis-a-vis -vis land tenure, land rights uh, gives uh, indigenous people and local communities the agency and also empowers them to transform the laws uh, affecting their lands. I also want to um, talk about you know, the, um, the fact that the land and environment and climate justice sector can be very siloed. And I, I, I say this, I think essentially most of the justice sectors I find are very siloed and people are working in, uh, you know, not on an intersectional level and uh, there's no cross, uh, cross pollination of ideas and yet, I, you know, when you look at um, issues, whether it's uh, climate, gender, they, it's, it's cross-cutting. It's not just you know, in one particular area. So the LEF is focused on field building and we plan to encourage uh, engagement in this cross-movement and intersectional realm because without environmental justice, we can't achieve economic, health, social, or racial justice. But I also think it's important to break down and demystify or simplify the, the language uh, of environmental and climate change. You know, before COP26, I have a, a neighbor, a good friend and a neighbor um, who works for a, a big organization, uh, a, a resource organization. And I asked her uh, before COP26 in Glasgow, I said, you know, she was heading to Glasgow for two weeks. And I said to her, so what is at stake at, um, at, at, at COP26, what should I be you know, talking about with grassroots organizations? 
and um, with community groups who are involved in climate, land, and environmental justice. And she pointed me to some published uh, documents um, that were summaries of the um, uh, of the COP26 agenda. And, and she said, you know, these, those particular documents will give you a very good idea of what it is we're going to discuss and the outcomes that we are seeking. So I read through this document several times and later, it's been four or five times and I went back to her and I said, you know, I need a PhD to even begin to understand what this, these documents are purporting to say. So my question to her therefore was, how do we, do we then expect you know, to make a difference in uh, environmental land and climate justice when you know, we don't understand the language. And this language is inaccessible to indigenous and local communities who are the very stewards of the natural resources we are seeking to, to protect. So in, you know, in that realm, you know, the Legal Empowerment Fund you know, will seek to work with organizations and seek to bring this language and these ideas and the laws of the land and the environmental justice um, um, a discourse much closer to the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Atieno, and uh, uh, thank you in particular for your passion for supporting grassroots communities and getting resources to them. Um, this, as you know, is a working session. Working session five is about building multi-stakeholder partnerships for change. And we've heard examples of partnerships for land and environmental justice in four areas in institutionalizing communities' roles in decision-making in government policies, in community monitoring of environmental impacts, and thirdly, in securing communities that are defending land and environment, and fourthly, in providing financial support to legal empowerment groups and frontline communities. So a warm thanks to you, Jobo, Jerti, Gabriel, and Atieno for sharing your very rich experiences and for the very good work that you're doing and I hope will continue to do. So now we will hear from you, our participants, and I call on Marlon Manuel of Namati to explain how we will do the discussion in the breakout groups. Marlon. Thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, much uh, Mary. And uh, we are honored again to have you and uh, to have a climate justice uh, champion uh, with us today. Thank you very much. So now we will go to our uh, the second part of our of our discussion. By the way, if you have questions uh, for for our speakers, you can use the the chat box to type your uh, to send your questions. We will have a final plenary later after uh, our breakout session. And now we will go into four groups. Uh, So we will be we will be having four groups. Uh, the first group will be on security. The second group will be on community uh, community monitoring, and then we have a group on uh, enshrining the rights for community decision making in law. So and and then finally on financing on funding. So you will see uh, the four breakout rooms open and then we will allow participants to join whichever uh, topic you want. And in the breakout room, we want the participants to discuss the following questions. Number one is uh, just to share your own experiences about uh, what has worked in, in that particular area. So if you are in the area of security, so please share your own uh, programs, your own experiences of uh, enhancing the capacity of communities to safeguard uh, their members and, and the community collectively uh, against uh, threats. And then second, uh, we also want to ask, how can we unite? How can we work together across geographies to make these types of uh, successful actions more common? And, and how would you in particular, how would you or your organization like to participate in that movement? So I will, um, I will ask uh, my colleagues to uh, to open the to open the breakout rooms, we will have. For this, we will have fifteen minutes. Those who will require translation, we will request you to remain in the main room, and we will continue our discussion in the main room for those who will require translations, uh, because we will not have translations in the breakout uh, in the breakout room. So after fifteen minutes, we will all go back 
to uh, the plenary room for our final plenary session. And if you have questions, uh, then we will have time to address those questions later. Okay, so now you can see the, the four breakout rooms. So you just click join, just click uh, the topic that you want to, to, be part, uh, to be part of. So one is security, two is community monitoring, three is enshrining rights for community in law, and then fourth is uh, funding. And then we will request our speakers. Jobo will be joining the uh, group three. Uh, Gabriel will be joining group one. Jurti will be joining group two, and Atieno will be uh, in group four funding. So please uh, choose your group. A quick, uh, a quick sharing of what had been discussed, some key takeaways from the discussions uh, in a group. I'll, I'll start uh, with, uh, with what you have uh, discussed in, in group one, group on security. And, uh, we, we, were, we were discussing the value of uh, uh, activities on security, on, sec on security, uh, security mechanisms. And um, I, I, I find it very interesting what Gabriel was saying, that uh, in Mexico, communities are already, they already have protective mechanisms in place. Uh, not so much for political threats, but uh, maybe for, for ordinary well, criminal, criminal threats. So they already have, communities already have their own security uh, protective measures. Uh, they, they don't see it as, uh, as uh, a strategy, as a, as a collective strategy to secure themselves. So um, what ProDesk is doing is to work with communities and to be intentional and deliberate in ensuring that they are, number one, prioritizing risks to them uh, in relation to their being defenders, to their being human rights defenders. And uh, at also, also focusing their protective mechanisms that they already have in place, and this time becoming uh, more strategic and more focused on the, on the priority issues that, uh, that they have. Um, and, and so that, that, that strengthens the community. One other point that, uh, that was mentioned in our conversation, uh, Gabriel said, when you strengthen the, the capacity of the community or an organization to secure itself and to secure the members, that in itself strengthens the community and the organization in general. So I think that's, that's one uh, great thought uh, that, that we had from the group. Can we hear from group two? Group two is on community monitoring. We're a group of four and the, the my, well, Nayan and Asia and Tintin can add. But my own takeaway was that uh, to be able to, community monitoring is important, but uh, we answered more the question, the second question on how can successful efforts become common. And uh, the suggestion was we can build our own local organizations and strengthen what we have and then link it up with a global movement. And then there was a suggestion of enabling local communities themselves from the ground having exchanges because there's a value among example indigenous peoples talking to each other uh, you know not only legal empowerment groups but the communities themselves having an exchange so that example the communities from africa and communities from uh, mexico or the philippines um, something that i think can benefit them and then the the, um, the movement, in a sense, comes from the ground. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jerti. That's group two. So we now go to group three. This is Jobo's uh, group and training the rights for community decision making in law, in government policy. Anybody from that group, group three, who would like to share? Um, I, 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 can, I can share since I took the notes. 
Um, pe people in our group, uh, it was a very geographically diverse group, um, experiences from Brazil, Albania, Sierra Leone, and myself in the United States, um, outlined how complicated it was to uh, pull together a variety, like a, a vast diversity of perspectives to get representatives from every community and try and find consensus uh, because there are opinions across the spectrum and that takes time. Uh, and that takes, a, um, it, it's, a, it's an involved process that starts from the local level and goes to the national level. And in the end, inevitably not everyone is satisfied but at least you sometimes end up with a situation that is better than before, and then you work with that. And there was discussion how there were two stages. One stage is actually getting something enshrined, the rights enshrined in law or, or, or policy, but then the other challenge is implementing that law or policy. And that in itself is, is very um, important and um, cannot be overlooked and then involves broad sensitization and working with communities. So uh, basically the takeaway that is that you can't take for granted, it's not just like a, a public uh, input and commenting process that there is in, in intense investment that has to be put into the process and that it's complicated by the fact that ecosystems span um, national borders and so to be very uh, impactful there, there there's there's a continuing challenge of coordinating as in the case in brazil the rainforest is uh, the amazon goes to colombia peru multiple countries trying to figure out how to work transnationally we didn't quite get to the second question there's not much time and also frank um teddy happy from um, albania was cut off in the middle of his his contribution i'd love if he could share some of of, of his experience in the chat if possible it's not a lot of time but um was rich for where it was thank you Thank you, Abby, and thank you for group three. Let's hear from group four. Group four is the group on funding. That's at Tiano's group. Anyone from that group who would like to share some key takeaways? Akila? Sure, yes, this is Akila uh, with Namati and the Legal Empowerment Network. So I can share a couple just to start us off and then um, hope others will add. But we, um, you know, started off talking about the problem <laughs> rather than what worked. But I think, you know, just because um, funding is remains such a challenge and when we talk about um, legal empowerment and legal support it, it's still hard to find organizations that are investing in the grassroots and still more funding tends to go to institutions and more top-down approaches um, and you know Rafa from uh, the Cayenne feminist organization shared some of the challenges that she experiences in her legal empowerment work on um, working with um, you know women and girls on issues of gender violence as well uh, and you know in terms of what has worked um, you know we talked about a couple things looking at you know, other sectors, um, you know, ministries of land, ministries of women, um, and sort of taking a more intersectional approach to securing funding for grassroots group, um, you know, moving beyond sort of the justice sector, um, you know, sharing knowledge and learnings among groups about what works, um, and then collaboration and using partnerships and uh, leveraging spaces like the uh, Open Government Partnership, the OGP, to try and secure government commitments to financing, though, of course, you know, moving beyond commitments to actual implementation is challenging. And then, of course, the Legal Empowerment Fund is a new model of financing, um, which hopefully works. Um, and we'd love to revisit that after the first round of funding and, uh, you know, see how grassroots organizations have experienced um, receiving funds uh, through the LEF, which I think is a, is a new model of um, ensuring that grassroots groups get core funding for their work. Uh, we didn't get to talk very much about part two, but we did talk about how we need to spread the word about the, the opportunity for funding through the LEF and think about how the Legal Empowerment Fund can leverage some of the information that it's been gathering, the knowledge uh, through this first round of funding to really secure more funding for grassroots groups and um, engage in, in further advocacy around that. Uh, so if, if I may have missed anything, please um, feel free to add others in, in the group. Thank you, uh, Akila. Okay, we have uh, a few more minutes remaining for us, and we will devote this to some uh, questions from our attendees. And I will start by asking uh, Gabrielle and uh, Jurti. And, and please, uh, for our attendees, please feel free to, uh, to uh, type your questions uh, while uh, I'm throwing this question to Gabrielle and Jurti. 
How important is the role of legal empowerment groups like ELAC in the Philippines and PRODESC in Mexico uh, in working with communities to strengthen their capacities as uh, land and environmental justice defenders? I can start. Uh, okay, okay, thank you, Marlon. Um, the, the guidance that we can provide uh, in the process that we also learn from them actually is an, as an, is an important process of capacity building. Um, this means knowledge, acquiring knowledge, skills, and also the attitude. Because getting to know the law and uh, monitoring the implementation is not easy, especially if you want to gather evidence, you want to become a paralegal, a monitoring a person or enforcer. Um, they realize that laws that we have are only as good as their implementation. So therefore, the being watchdogs or, or monitors, in a sense, are very important. And then lastly, whatever that they do, uh, the legal empowerment work can also lead to advocacy work if there's policy reform needed, plus strategic litigation and also governance work uh, because they also, we engage with uh, government agencies or government officials in the process when we uh, have the documentation in place or the committees themselves participate in uh, local government bodies. So they provide um, important inputs in, in this process. Plus, I think last point, Planning. Planning is also a tedious uh, activity, tedious process that uh, also needs time. So capacity building and proper attitudes would be needed there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Zerti. Gabriel? Sí, claro. Uh, yes, sure. We, from Prudesk, work under something that we call uh, uh, whole uh, defense methodology. So this is knowing that defending human rights, especially with these communities, has to go beyond the actions while litigating with legal, beyond uh, legal actions. Uh, because of the process that we have uh, protested, strategic uh, trials, five, six, seven years, we think that strengthening communities and collectives is the only way as a community can maintain, uh, can keep defending the rights before a court of law. We think that uh, acknowledging these people not, not as subject, sorry, not as objects, but subjects of rights, working with these people to promote that they uh, recognize themselves as uh, holders of human rights, that they assume a process of training in the matter of those rights. And at the same time, they build alliances with other organizations, other communities, or other collectives that have a similar job. That is really the only way of keeping a community or a collective active in a process of demanding justice that, as I mentioned, could last many, many years. Something that I believe is extremely important when we talk about strengthening communities, acknowledging the main role that women have, especially in the processes of defending land and territory, especially when we talk about exercising uh, our collectives and the importance of constantly promoting, including young people, children, and young people in these defense processes. Since we are having new generations, the possibility that these battles, these efforts of the people that nowadays are leaders could be taken for new generations and the, this allows that defense processes can last and keep, can go on over time. So strengthening the ability of the community, building collective power is the only way we have, we can defend the human rights. 
Gracias, uh, Gabriel. Any questions uh, from our participants? You may unmute your mic if you want, or you can uh, you can type your questions in the chat. Or you can also choose to answer the question that, that uh, we did not have time to, to answer during the breakout, which is how can we unite together across, uh, across countries and regions to address uh, the challenges facing us? I would like to add uh, like, um, something i think it's obvious and everyone know but uh, uh, maybe we can uh, use this opportunity that we now uh, at least i and kayan know more organizations that they uh, based on the grassroots and do grassroots legal empowerment uh, that uh, from my experience one of the things that women and youth in the ground really find as very powerful for them like to share experiences also and it gave like it give them um, the people hope like if uh, for example other minorities or women from other minorities in the world like success they, they can share their successes about achievements or processes that they are doing in terms of legal empowerment and uh, achieving their rights, um, it could be very like uh, powerful for women because we face a lot of challenges and sometimes, you know, disappointments, especially when there is political crisis and the uh, occupation and uh, ongoing discrimination in the political level uh, as the situation in Israel, Palestine. So it could be really, good opportunity and I invite any one of you like that we can collaborate in the future and do kind of webinars or uh, sharing like uh, successes and stories uh, and uh, represent it to the public and ensure that uh, uh, women from the grassroots like from the paralegal groups or that uh, they participate in the process of the legal empowerment uh, can, or can also take part of that and not just we the people that work on the organization. So this one thing that I see it as a, a workable and not related funded uh, funding and it could open also, you know, opportunities and ideas uh, for us. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rafa. Uh, Purvi. Thanks, Martin. Uh, just to pick up on the question that you were flagging, how do we work together? Uh, and then also um, echoing something that Rafa was saying about sort of sharing and um, you know collective uh, exchange. Uh, I just wanted to put a plug for uh, the, a learning agenda for legal empowerment. So the legal empowerment network, as you know, um, you know, there's hundreds of organizations around the world, um, thousands. Um, and as we look at the kind of next five to 10 years, it's clear that there are some questions that are burning and at the frontier of practice. And I think some of the ones that we're talking about here, like how do you build collective power? How do you, you know, in this context of like repression and closing civic spaces, like how are we keeping ourselves safe? How are we keeping communities safe? Uh, you know, financing, all of these are just like, burning questions at the front of everybody's mind and so the learning agenda is this collective initiative um, that we're launching very soon and over the next five to ten years we want to foster you know exactly what Rafa was saying the kind of let's you know as we're experimenting as we're learning in our own context let's share that with each other let's capture that systematically the contexts are often very different but there are there is tremendous value in being able to talk to each other and share strategies um, and what works and what doesn't work. Um, and so just wanted to put that uh, on everyone's radar that that's coming up uh, and hopefully that can provide a space um, and some structure um, for us to be having these conversations in a systematic way uh, and not sort of reinventing the wheel um, for what are clearly burning questions on all of our minds. Thank you, Purvi. Any other questions or answers to that, uh, that remaining question?
If there are no other questions, uh, I will give the final. Yeah, uh, I'll give the final minutes uh, to our speakers. But before that, uh, just to note that this is uh, one of of many conversations, uh, series of conversations that we'll be that we'll be having. Definitely, uh, we are identifying uh, key areas, key areas that that we can focus on together. And we started today with a session with uh, four key areas on uh, security, community monitoring, institutionalizing community power and decision making in laws and government policies, and financing in support of uh, grassroots communities. In the next, uh, in the in 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 the next uh, few weeks or months, we will continue to engage in conversations in these four areas, and. Um, trying to, to grapple uh, with, with that challenge of how we can work together and we can link up with each other across, uh, across different countries and regions to, to work together on, on this, uh, on, on having learning from each other, uh, collective learning, and also working together on, on certain key, uh, key issues and especially building on the community, on the power of the community. On the part of NAMATI and, uh, and the Legal Empowerment Network, uh, we have, since last year, we have engaged a few organizations. Many of you are, uh, are in, 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 that, uh, in that conversation to uh, identify priorities, key priority issues, and to collectively uh, develop a common agenda that we can work on in the next uh, in the next few years as a strategic uh, plan for, for the group and uh, broadening the conversation to engage more organizations, more communities uh, in, in, in many countries on, uh, on the conversation and on the, on the, on the collective action that uh, we'll, be, we'll be engaging in. So I will, uh, any, any, uh, any final announcements? Uh, if none, I will give the floor uh, to Jerti, Gabriel, Jobo, and Athena for any final messages. Short messages, Jerti first. Um, my own message is to express my gratitude to all our colleagues. Uh, we should continue the conversation. I could imagine that the time short to be able to share more. Uh, as we say in the Philippines, Mabuhay. Thank you, Jerti. Um, Atieno here. I just wanted to say thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. And it was great to hear from uh, grassroots organizations, Gabriel and Gerti, who are working in the trenches. And I'd really like to hear more about your, your experiences and how the LEF can you know, support your work. Um, and in the same line as Gerti said, I will say in Swahili, Asanteni sana kwaheri. Thank you, Athena. Gabriel? I'm gonna give my final words in English. Um, I just wanna sort of uh, recap something that I think Rafa said. And um, I, I deal with security for human rights defenders. However, I, I do and I value the, the importance of remaining hopeful at the end of the day. And I think there are reasons to be hopeful. And I think we need to start every day thinking about that. Um, even though we might not see it, but there are reasons There are reasons to keep on doing this work. So I just wanna share that with everyone. And I'm also gonna share a few words in Spanish. Um, muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much to everyone for this excellent work uh, from my heart and my soul. Big hug. Gracias, uh, Gabriel. Uh... I'm looking for Jobo. Jobo, are, are you still around? Okay, I don't think uh, uh, Jobo is here. So you'd like to thank again uh, our speakers, uh, Jerti, Gabriel, Ateno, and Jobo, and of course, uh, Mary, uh, who had to run to, uh, to prepare for the plenary, for the final plenary session here at... Uh, the World Justice Forum. So on behalf of NAMATI, the Legal Empowerment Network, uh, ELAC, PRODES, uh, the Legal Empowerment Fund, and uh, the government of Sierra Leone, uh, represented by 
uh, Jobo Samba. We thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. And uh, we will reach out to you and we will keep in touch because there are many other questions that remain unanswered. And uh, we hope that we can continue uh, looking for answers and working together uh, to find solutions and to work uh, on the solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon from The Hague, from the World Justice Forum. Salamat. Salamat po.